If you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 6. Uh, we're continuing our study into the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter number 6. Uh, to do a little bit of background before we begin the chapter, remember in Revelation chapter 5, God was sitting on his throne and he had on his hand a book or a scroll. Uh, it's I liked the translation of a book because this is a multi-sealed piece of parchment, uh, which you know, the scrolls in Israel were the same way, but culturally speaking, if we talk about books, uh, some people can better understand it, and that this is a multi-chaptered and therefore multi-sealed uh, book, and it's sealed, and uh, the elders and the beasts, or who we know as the seraphim that were around the throne, were crying out loud, and John was weeping because no one was found in heaven or on earth that was worthy enough to take the scroll from God, from God the Father. However, then he saw the Lamb who was slain, Jesus Christ, and he is worthy. And we know here that Jesus goes to the throne of God, and he takes uh, the book from the Father's hand. He takes the sealed scroll, um, which is uh, the title deed to the earth. So Christ is about to exercise judgment upon the earth, and he's about to break the seals. Uh, so let us begin in chapter number 6, beginning in verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. So one of the seraphim had to get John's attention uh, because it was such a horrific event and such a powerful event, probably one that shocked John. So John goes over. Verse number two, And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. So what we're about to read about here. Uh, in these first four seals of the seven-sealed scroll, is what many refer to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. This first horse, I will, and this first horseman, I want to make sure that you do not get this one uh, confused uh, with the horse that we'll read later on in chapter 19, verse 11. Of course, Christ is the one who's coming in on the white horse on that one. But it is important to note that uh, because of who is this horseman. Uh, it's white. The horse is white, just like Christ's horse is going to be white. He has a bow, which a bow is a symbol of peace. So he's promising peace, which Christ promises peace. And gives peace. And it says, And a crown was given to, unto him. And Jesus Christ, of course, is king. So many may be confused, saying, Well, is this not speaking of Christ? No, it's speaking of what I've talked about before in First John. It's talking of the Antichrist. And if you remember, one of the characteristics of an Antichrist is that they try to imitate Jesus, but they're not Jesus. They take on the title of God. They take on the title of Savior. They take on. Uh, they try to say that they can do the same attributes of Jesus, uh, but they fall drastically short. They are not Lord. Uh, they are deceivers. Uh, but this is the capital A anti Christ. He is released onto the world, and again he's mimicking Christ. He comes onto a white horse. And it's uh, figurative that he does have a bow because he has a bow, but you don't see the arrows mentioned. Uh, so he's coming in what we think is going to be peace uh, because he has no arrows. Uh, but as we'll see later on, he's got those arrows hidden so we can't see them. So when he first appears unto men, it'll seem that he's a peaceful person, that he just wants world peace. He wants us all to, quote-unquote, get along. And this crown, okay, there's two Greek words for crown. Uh, the Greek word that is used here is Stephanos. The other Greek word for crown is diademum, 
where we get our word diadem. Stephanos crown, which we see here. Well, let me talk about the diadem, the diadem. Um, many of you probably already know what this stands for. A diadem is an ornate crown that a king wears, that a true king wears. It's usually inlaid with gold, precious rubies, and stones, and it's specific and special to the king. The Stephanos crown that's talked here was kind of like those laurel leaf uh, wreath crowns uh, that, if you remember, I talked about uh, with some of the churches uh, before, uh, such as Smyrna, where they were uh, big into the games, the Olympic games and stuff like that. And victors were given those laurel wreath crowns that were only temporary. Uh, they were there to uh, give to temporary victors, uh, those who may seem victorious for a time being, but when the games came around again, they would probably lose their title to more fit individuals or even younger individuals who are more fit than them. Uh, the olive branches, of course, decayed away. They weren't permanent like the precious gold of the diadem. Uh, they were false crowns. Uh, they were just temporary crowns. Uh, so this, the Antichrist uh, comes and he's given a, uh, a, f uh, a temporary title. Uh, a temporary uh, seat of power, so to speak. Um, so this is uh, the first horseman that rides on the first horse, the Antichrist. And of course, he went forth conquering and to conquer. So he will take over uh, the world. Uh, verse number three. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that set thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So again, a white horse uh, was there um, to mock Christ. It's the Antichrist, so he's mocking Christ. He's trying to pretend to be Christ. Uh, but white is also symbolic of peace, uh, which he comes under a false peace. Uh, these are horses, too, by the way. Uh, the reason why we read of horses being the first four seals is because these are going to be swift judgments. And horses represented swiftness. Uh, they represented a coming war, a coming judgment. Uh, the thunderings of horses, of course, back then was known for wartime and for future judgment. Uh, but they were also known for their swiftness. So these will happen uh, rather quickly. Uh, the Antichrist will come, and during this time that he comes, it's not going to be peace on earth, because this red horse represents war. There's going to be great war over all the earth. It says that power was given to him that he set thereon to take peace from the earth, so there's going to be war, uh, turmoil, and that they should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. In verse 5, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard a third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Uh, this black horse is going to represent famine and plague. Uh, he's going to come across, but it's mostly going to be uh, famine. Uh, it's going to be a time of uh, great want, and it's going to be economic turmoil. Uh, I say economic turmoil and collapse uh, because, again, it's the blackness, um, but the balance is in this hand. And if you break down what he's talking about there, measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny, if you were to relate that in today's time and money, He's basically, they're basically saying that a loaf of bread is going to cost a day's wage. Uh, that's what a day's wage was. Um, some translations uh, use the correct um, monetary measurement they had back then of a denarius. Uh, that was normally a day's wage for an individual. So it's saying that you're going to be paying uh, about a day's wage uh, just to buy a loaf of bread. To just to buy your common food for your family uh, to survive. Uh, that should be alarming because we, we can kind of see that happening and taking place right now. 
even though we're not in the midst of the tribulation, and even though the church will be raptured away and we won't experience this, um, the reason, again, why we have the revelation is because it warns us to be prepared. And if we look at world events right now, this should really alarm us. Uh, the rising costs of food and basic necessities has skyrocketed in over just a, a couple years. And we've really seen how fragile our economy really can be. Um, so we can see easily how this can happen uh, during this time of tribulation. And this judgment is coming from God. Um, he's saying, you know, this economic... And, but if you see in verse 6 there, he says, And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So this isn't going to affect everybody. Uh, this famine uh, that's going to be unleashed on the earth, it's going to affect the majority. Uh, but the oil and the wine, uh, what that represented there, um, there's going to be these elite individuals, uh, the rich. Uh, the oil and the wine represented those who were more wealthy, those who were weather off. And it says, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Um, and they're doing that because it's going to give us false sense of hope. Um, but it's there and it's, it's, it's troubling. Uh, something that we uh, need to be. But there, it's definitely a restriction there uh, by God uh, that it's not going to affect everybody. And then verse number 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal... I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Now let's talk about this rather quickly. Uh, it says a pale horse. Uh, I, we have to get a correct understanding of that term pale. Uh, when we think pale today, we think of white. Uh, so we may get confused in saying there's two white-colored horses. I've seen pictures as well of uh, the pale horse, and they kind of give this one a creamish-looking uh, color. Um, and it does represent sickness, all oh, your pale, um, and because sickness and plague is definitely one of the things that is brought here by death. Uh, but that word in the Greek is chloros, uh, which is where we get our word chlorophyll. It's actually a greenish color. Uh, it's standing for that greenish, and again, that represents sickness as well, turning green, if you've ever heard, you know, uh, or, oh, is your stomach upset? Are you turning green? As in when sailors get seasickness and such more like, so you're getting that, that it's a sickly colored horse. Uh, this horse is not beautiful in any way, shape, or means. It's not majestic. It's a sickly horse. Um, and I looked and behold the sickly horse, and his name that set on him was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth <clears throat> to kill with the sword, so they're going to die by war, they're going to die by hunger, and they're going to die by nature just revolting against itself, because it says even the beasts of the field are going to revolt. And again, if we're having this great famine, if we're having these great tragedies, this great turmoil, you're going to see upheavals even in nature take place here. Uh, but you're going to see plagues. Uh, sometimes plagues is translated into here as well. Um, so we're going to see this uh, very much here. And I want to make sure you understand uh, the gravity of this verse. Uh, right now on the earth, it's estimated that there's roughly 8 billion people on the earth. That there's roughly 8 billion people today on our earth, on our planet. A fourth of them is going to die when the seal is broken. That's two billion people that's going to perish. This isn't some small event. This is going to be a large, horrendous, and horrific event. And it's going to come swiftly. It's going to be catastrophic. And again, people are going to die of a combination of things. Uh, but the ultimate penalty is going to be death. And it's going to be 
uh, like I said, and it could be even larger because it's not happened yet and the human population is doing nothing but increasing at time. So we're going to see a tragedy, a tragic loss of human lives. And this should be sobering to the Christian. It is sobering, but it should also be a motivator for us to share the gospel. Because again, those who are saved will not experience this because they will be raptured uh, into heaven and this wrath will not be poured out upon his children. Verse number 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. This, of course, is the martyrs. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So these are the martyrs. Uh, the seal judgment um, is represents and it presents the martyrdom of the tribulation saints, those that realize that they weren't raptured in heaven, uh, but they come into a believing uh, because of that event, because of the fact that they weren't raptured. Uh, they realize the truth of the gospel and they repent. Uh, they become saved during this time. Uh, they don't obey the Antichrist. They don't bow the knee. They don't worship him. Uh, and they they will refuse to take the mark, as we learn later on. Uh, but uh, these are those that refuse uh, to follow. And they're going to be martyred for their uh, faith. Um, they will come to faith in Christ following the rapture. And many will be killed um, by satanic opposition because of their testimony of Christ. And uh, it's during this time they're going to plead for God's judgment on their unbelieving oppressors. Uh, they're going to want judgment on the Antichrist. They're going to go ahead and get it done. Uh, the white robes that's talked about here depict their righteous uh, standing before God. Um, but more saints will be martyred um, because there's much more tribulation uh, left to come. So the cry of the martyrs will come out uh, with this fifth seal. In verse number 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became a black as sath clock of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid. Uh, they hid. One second here. They hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And again, the sixth seal, we have uh, the whole universe is basically finally groaning out in its final birth pangs. Um, we see catastrophic uh, universal events. Uh, the earth itself will quake, uh, will, will suffer severe earthquakes, just as Jesus predicted in Matthew chapter 24. Um, the sun is going to go through a horrific event uh, to where it's even going to be blackened, uh, so we're probably going to start uh, seeing uh, what many um, astronomers uh, refer to as the dying of the sun. We're going to see uh, that time of the sun uh, caving in on itself, and, and therefore it's turning black as sackcloth and, and not giving up its, uh, its as much light as it was. Uh, its intensity is going to be fierce. And it says, And the moon become, became as blood. Now this is interesting because there's 
a lot of um, interest in the blood moons because we hear blood moons all the time. And sometimes with the reflection of the sun, uh, there is a reddish hue uh, that's shown on the face of the moon. Um, that's not what it's talking about here. This is going to be uh, the moon actually turning red. And what's interesting is there's articles out right now that were written even just last year uh, where astronomers have discovered uh, ferrous iron on the face of the moon, and they don't know where it came from. Um, they're puzzled by it. They don't know why it's uh, being produced on the moon, uh, but what that ferrous iron is, um, is it's red. Uh, just like the ferrous iron uh, that inhabits Mars um, is now being found in small traces on the moon. Now, it's not overtaking right now, uh, and it won't be overtaken until this time of tribulation. Uh, but again, this should just be a sign that God will accomplish what he wants to accomplish. And these signs are something that, again, Jesus referred to in, in the book of Matthew uh, during his uh, time of the Mount of Olives and his Olivet Discourse. He was saying, uh, you can watch the weather and you know the time is coming, uh, so beware. Jesus was promising us that he would tell us this is a revelation of Jesus Christ towards the end time. So he's saying when you start seeing these signs, know that my time is almost at hand, that I will be coming back. So this should give hope to the Christian and again should motivate us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says, And the stars of heaven fell into the earth, in verse uh, 13. So again, astro asteroids, meteorites, uh, stuff like that are going to become uh, more uh, heavily uh, thing here this time. Uh, and the heavens are basically going to split open. Uh, it's going to be a great time in pain. And the rulers of the earth, um, the great men, everything else, the rulers of the earth, those that are happy are going to cry out in pain. Um, they're going to, instead of crying in repentance, though, uh, they're going to cry for pity and, and mercy. It's not repentance. They just want the pain to stop. Uh, they don't recognize God for his godhood. They don't recognize the Lord Jesus for his His lordship. Um, they just want it to stop. Um, it's funny how during times of tragedy, instead of men genuinely getting on their knees in repentance unto a holy God and accepting his judgment, accepting his will as they would, uh, they just want to go to say sorry so they don't have to suffer anymore. Uh, but then when the suffering ends, they're right back at it. And they never do uh, bow the knee to God. Uh, so that uh, is the end of uh, chapter number six. Uh, we have six seals opened, and six judgments have been poured out onto the earth. The first four uh, through the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Again, the first uh, being that of uh, the Antichrist, uh, the white horse, the red horse, being that of war. Uh, the black horse that follows in the third seal is that of uh, of uh, economic collapse, uh, economic collapse, economic turmoil, and famine. And then, of course, uh, the fourth horse uh, represents a sickness and plague um, and death uh, that will come in many ways, shape, and form, both by war, uh, by famine, um, by plague. Um, by many different ways, but where a fourth of the world's population will be taken away. We have the fifth seal, uh, which is the announcements of the martyrs. Uh, those that have been martyred for the faith are going to cry out for justice, and Jesus Christ will give them justice. And then we have the sixth seal, uh, which we just read about here, which is the universal uh, crying out. Uh, we start seeing... Uh, because God is the creator of all. He's not just the creator of the earth, but he was also creator of the sun and the moon. Again, these are symbolic, um, even going back to creation, going back through there. And then in chapter 7, uh, we'll talk about the seventh seal, because the seventh seal will trigger off another set of events and another set of judgments as we continue to go along in this book. So go ahead and read, read a little bit ahead in Revelation chapter 7. I pray that this uh, is simple for you to follow along. Again, the book of Revelation is not something uh, to be afraid of. Um, let's cherish it, uh, let's love it, and let's learn by it. Until then, stay strong 
stay bold and remember uh, Jesus Christ is coming soon. His return is nigh. So spread that gospel, share the gospel. Until then, I'll see you in the next podcast.